Hi, and welcome to another English language A-level video with me, Paul, from the QE here in Darlington. And so this one is about discourse, not that course, discourse, the language level of discourse. Discourse is a, a tricky kind of concept to define because it has multiple meanings. Uh, we're going to think about discourse in terms of that definition there. So a language level concerned with patterns across larger stretches of text. So whereas previous levels, like for example, Lexis and grammar, have been honing in at a micro level at individual words or individual sentences, what you're doing in discourse is you're standing back and you're getting more of like the big picture. So it's the patterns that are going across the text. Um, so if you were here in my classroom now, I would be playing you a tape of an anecdote. And let's just see if I can actually get into this now. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. It depends whether Moodle will allow me to do this. No, it doesn't look like it's going to allow me to do this. So, um, okay, we're thinking here about narrative structure. So we're thinking about when people tell about their experiences, um, what kind of structure do they tend to, does their language tend to fall into? And you'll be, not be surprised to hear that there's been some kind of research done about this. Okay, and so the, a famous researcher is William Labov, who's kind of like the godfather of social linguistics. And he's mentioned on page 51 in the AQA textbook. So um, in the 1970s, William Labov, um, he did lots of field work in New York. Uh, in which he interviewed people and speakers gave accounts of their personal experiences. And what he suggested is that people's discourse uh, fell into a certain kind of structure. And so here is the structure. So first of all, when people begin talking about their experiences, they often start with some kind of abstract. So this is kind of like a, a discourse marker where uh, it's an indication that the speaker wants a listener's attention and is signaling the start of a narrative. We then go into the orientation. So this is telling the listener who is it happened to, uh, what is basically happening, uh, where is it happening, and when's it happening? And so these set the scene and obviously provide the, the background, the important background information. We then move into the complicating action. So this is the, the main body of the narrative. And then as the story goes on, we move towards the resolution. So this is the ending of the narrative. And the hope is that this ties up loose ends and it provides some kind of closure. And then he applies a kind of musical term on the end here for a coda. So this is a signal that the narrative has ended. OK, so those are all explained in the textbook on page 51. There is William Labov. He also threw in a couple of other uh, terms to remember. One is called internal evaluation and the other one is called the external evaluation. So an internal evaluation is an expression of attitude towards the events in a narrative that occur in the same time frame as the main action. So it's where the speaker talks about what they thought or felt at the time. That's an internal evaluation. And kind of like the opposite of that is the external evaluation, which is an expression of attitude where the speaker kind of stands back from the main action. So this is the speaker kind of standing back from the story and talking about their thoughts and feelings outside the action. OK, uh, and there is an example given in the textbook, which is a good one. Uh, it's done multicolored here in order to show how you can apply Labov's category. So what we'll do is we'll talk through this one. And then I'll give you another slice of uh, speaker, speak, somebody speaking, and then you will apply the categories yourself. OK, well, at the weekend, I went to get my hair done at the salon. This is me talking, of course. At the weekend, I went to get my hair done at the salon. And when I was there, I saw my friend who gave me an invitation for a wedding. It was lovely to see her and a surprise to hear she was getting married, which we will look forward to going to in a couple of weeks. And after that, I went to the shops and I did some shopping with my partner, Craig. And then we went home and I had a very boring task of putting it all away. Not my favourite thing to do. 
Anyway, that's all really. Okay, so let's, what would Lavrov say about these nar narrative categories? He would say that well bit at the beginning is your abstract. So this is an indication that the speaker wants a listener's attention. It's like a discourse marker. At the weekend, I went to get my hair done at the salon. So this is your orientation. This is providing basic information to set up the story. Like, you know, what was happening, when, to who, and where. And then we're into the complicating action. When I was there, I saw my friend who gave me an invitation for her wedding. So there's your complicating action, which is the main body of the narrative. Now, I've got this bit in black here. Now, this is what uh, Labov is arguing is a kind of internal evaluation. So this is this expression of attitude towards the event in a narrative that occurs in the same time frame as the main action. So this is what she was thinking and feeling at the time when she saw her friend. That's the bit in black. We're then back to the uh, complicating action here. Uh, after that, I went to the shops and I did some shopping with my partner Craig. And then we're moving towards the end of this fascinating anecdote, <clears throat> not in green. So this is the resolution. Then we went home and had the very boring task of putting it all away. And then that bit in black there, not my favourite thing to do, would be an example of an external evaluation, where she's kind of saying this outside the time frame of her anecdote. Anyway, that's all really, is your coda. Okay, so this is useful if you've got a, a single person who's narrating an anecdote. Um, it might be an idea for you to have a go at doing that. It's in the textbook on page 52. So have a look at it and try and break it down in terms of Lambert's narrative categories. I'll pause the video there. Okay, I'm assuming that you have done that. Or Assuming makes an ass out of you and me. Okay, there is another theorist in town. So this is more recent. This is Charles Goodwin, who also came up with a theory of narrative structure. He's looking at similar sorts of things. So people uh, spontaneously talking about anecdotes and personal experiences. But the big difference with this is that it's interaction with a listener. Okay, so here are his uh, categories that he applies. He says that often stories begin with a story preface. So this is a signal that the speaker wants to tell a story and it's an invitation for others to show interest. But then you get the story solicit. So this is the response from somebody that yes, they do want to listen to the story. We're then into the preliminary. So this is the background information to the story in the form of the who, what, where, and all of that business, which is exactly the same as Labov's um, orientation. We then have the story action, which is the main body of the narrative, which is the same as Labov's complicating action. We have the story climax, conclusion of the narrative, which is the same as Labov's resolution. And then we've got story appreciation. So this is a signal from the audience that communicates their response to the narrative. Okay, so this is a six part narrative structure, preface, solicit, preliminary, story action, story climax, story appreciation. This is how it works in practice. So we've got an interaction here between two students. Well, I've often found Rob rude. Why, well, what's he done to you? Do you? Do you want, do you really want to know? Yes, tell me. Okay, well, I had this new sofa and he just came in, yeah, put his feet all over it. You know, we'd only just got it, right? I told him, get your feet off. And he laughed. <laughs> how rude. Yeah, loser. <laughs> right, how can we apply Goodwin's narrative categories to what's going on here? Well, obviously, we've got a story preface at the beginning here. Well, I've often found Rob rude. There's his story preface. Uh, you could also argue that that bit is his story preface as well. And then your story solicit would be this. Why? What's he done to you? Yes, tell me. Obviously, the listener is eager to hear about this story. We then have the preliminary of the story, all this information. I had this new sofa and he just came in. And then we're into the main action. 
So this is the main body of the narrative. He put his feet all over it. And I told him, get your feet off. And he laughed. So there's your main action. Yeah. Uh, moving towards, I suppose, to a climax. Uh, and the story appreciation, I suppose, would be uh, the listener saying how rude. So mirroring A's uh, thoughts on that. And also laughing as well when A says loser. Okay, so it could be useful when you're looking at narrative categories and when you're looking, I should say, at transcripts of everyday speech. It also, I suppose, could be applied to uh, interactions that are going on social media as well, like on Facebook, for example. Okay, let's think about adjacency exchanges uh, if we think about discourse, because uh, discourse is about your, your patterns that are going across speech. And adjacency exchanges are those predictable patterns that you see in everyday speech. Here's an example. Would you like to come to the cinema tonight? Yes. OK, so this kind of question answer, lots of conversations revolve around that. That would be what's called an adjacency exchange or an adjacency pair. Um, the second bit of an adjacency exchange is either called a preferred response or a dispreferred response. Uh, again, this is in the textbook. It's on page 53 and 54. So a preferred response is the second part of an adjacency pair, and it fits in with what the speaker of the first part wants to hear. So here's an example. The teacher says, so what is the capital of China? Anyone? Is it Beijing? Is your preferred response. So it fits in with what the the speaker of the first part wants to hear. A dispreferred response is where the second part of an adjacency pair doesn't fit in with what the speaker wants to hear. Example, so what is the capital of China? Anyone? Why do we need to know this? Uh, so that's a dispreferred response. And of course, you could apply Grice's conversational maxims because you could argue that in the second one there, the student there is flouting some of Grice's maxims. I will leave it to you to, to think of which one. OK, so these are adjacency exchanges. We also have the notion of insertion sequences. Again, this is on page 54 in your textbook. This is an addi additional sequence that is between two parts of an adjacency pair. So would you like to come with me to the cinema tonight? Why, what's on? Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Classic movie. Yes. So the bit in red there is your insertion sequence. OK, so at this point, you need to be reviewing what you've learned so far about discourse, not that course, discourse. You need to be uh, remembering Labov's five narrative categories. You need to be remembering Charles Goodwin's story structure. And you need to be remembering about what are adjacency exchanges. Now we move on. Uh, let's just put together all of the kind of AO1 terms that you need when you're analysing conversation. This is useful for you if you get a transcript on your meanings and representations. Paper 1, Section A. Uh, it's also going to be very useful for many of you on your language investigations if you're doing some kind of analysis of everyday speech. So here are a shed load of AO1 terms. Pause the video there. How many of those can you define or give an example of? OK, and so we will go through these remorselessly. So a non-fluency feature means, uh, well, spontaneous talk is full, full of non-fluency features. This means that it's a feature of language that stops it from being standard English. So it's the kind of fragmentary features of spontaneous speech that we get all of the time because we're thinking and talking quickly. We tend to do things like repetition, or uh, starting our sentences again, or pauses. So those are all examples of non-fluency features. Turn taking is just the patterns of who is saying what in a conversation. And this is uh, allied to this thing called MLU, mean length utterance. So that abbreviation MLU is quite useful. MLU is worked out by uh, counting up the number of words that a participant says in a conversation and dividing it by the number of terms that they have. 
Okay, so you should be able to make a comparison between two people and their MLUs. You know, person A might have an MLU of 100 and person B might have only have an MLU of 10, in which case it's telling you something about power, right? It's because it's showing you who is dominant in the conversation. So MLU is an aspect of turn taking. Adjacency exchange, we've just done. So the ritualistic patterns that you get in everyday conversation, like I greet you and ask after your health. You return the greeting and uh, reply about your health and ask after my health, which I completely ignore. Those are adjacency exchanges. So the ritualistic patterns that go on in everyday conversation. Elision, to be spelt with one L in comparison with ellipsis with two Ls. So elision is the missing out of sounds, okay? So that's kind of like, well, most of the time we're missing out sounds because we speak quickly. I mean, linguists say that we speak on average something like three words per second. Therefore, naturally, we're missing out sounds when we speak, when we're speaking at such speed. Okay, so we don't say bottle, we don't say bottle like that. We're eliding the t phoneme in the middle of that word. That's elision. Overlapping just means talking at the same time as another person. Um, to use a pejorative word, you would say interrupting. We don't tend to use the word interrupting because people overlap for a majority of reasons, a range of different reasons. It could be rudeness, right? You're just being rude. But it could be some other reason. It could be enthusiasm, for example. Uh, it could be that you're speaking on the phone and you're not able on the phone to pick up the kind of physical cues of when the next the other person you're speaking to is about to speak in which case you're going to be overlapping okay so overlapping means speaking at the same time as another person and therefore it's a kind of non-fluency feature ellipsis is the missing out of words so it's a grammatical feature been there done that got the t-shirt that would be an elliptical utterance Speaker support is the kind of work you do when you're listening to show that you're paying attention. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Really? Uh, so sometimes it's verbal, like really, and sometimes it's non-verbal, huh, like that. So that's often called uh, speaker support or back channeling behavior. And there is a certain amount of evidence that suggests that there is a gender difference. Uh, between males and females, you can guess whether it's males or females who tend to do more speaker support and back channeling. Agenda setting is sometimes called topic management, and this is the idea of who is deciding the topic that's being talked about. Uh, you can link that along with turn taking, you can link that in with power because obviously, if you're somebody with power in a particular conversation, it may well be that you are responsible for setting the agenda or setting managing the topic hedge is kind of like sort of what i'm kind of doing now mm -hmm. like that so when you're hedging it means that you're fudging your language and you may be putting in either verbal or non-verbal fillers and maybe you're doing it deliberately as a strategy in order to show that you're not too certain and dogmatic about things Shall we kind of go to McDonald's, maybe? Would be in a good example of hedging, where you're actually doing it in order to converge with your listener, uh, in order to show that you're accommodating them. Dayexis, we've done on a previous video, and that's context-dependent language. So there you need to be looking at the different forms of dayexit, whether it be spatial dayexis, temporal dayexis, or the other one. Uh, temporal dexis, uh, spatial, personal dexis. Okay, and then you've got the difference between distal dexis and what's the other one? proximal dexis as well. So there's lots of terms to remember on dexis. By the way, deictical utterance, deictical is how you would uh, say it in terms of an adjective. A tag question is simply a statement on which you tag a question form at the end, isn't it? So tag questions are interesting, and I think I've said on a previous video that there's been actually lots of earnest research done about how and why people use tag questions, with some suggestions of difference between the genders. 
discourse markers are those little words like so now then which indicate that you're going to start a new topic of conversation uh labiv labov and goodwin's narrative structure we've already talked about so i'm not going to bore you by reiterating those fillers i've already mentioned because i talked about it in reference to hedges so the fillers are basically nature's way of uh, giving us time to think what we're going to say next because we do think and speak so incredibly quickly we do need these devices to uh, to, to help us <clears throat> and then lastly but by no means least we have Paul Grice's conversational maxims being quality quantity relevance and manner now these are all a01 terms that are vital when you're analyzing bits of conversation okay bits of conversation like this a chat show so this is what i would be asking you to do in my class i would be asking you to analyze how the discourse and pragmatic features of this chat show interaction create meanings and representations and i've taken a little segment from the jonathan ross show in which he's interviewing julie walters the wonderful julie walters so on this uh, youtube clip it's from uh, one minute 55 seconds onwards and it's a little 30 second part of the show so here you'd be looking at all of these discourse terms that i've uh, just been talked through you've been trying to apply them and not forgetting of course your context terms as well because what you're trying to do is link these AO1 features to AO3 context, i.e. audiences, purposes, mode, and genre. <clears throat> now, in my booklet, the full transcript is on page 89 and uh, 90. Um, <clears throat> here is the beginning of the transcript, which we'll talk through in terms of discourse. Ross says, and you had a proper job for a while, didn't you? And Walter's answers, I was a nurse. Oh, hello. Here I am. Because up on the screen, there's, a, there's a, an image of her, a photograph of her when she was a teenage nurse. And Ross says, wow, look at you there. And Walter says, oh, it's awful. Stop. Ross says, look, no, it's beautiful. Just a, just a young nurse. Really lovely. That's not Victoria in front of you, is it? <clears throat> OK, so what are some of the discourse and pragmatic features that you could pick out? at the opening of this discourse first of all you've got a tag question haven't you and you had a proper job for a while didn't you now the function of that is that it's a as goodwin would say it's a story solicit it's enabling walters to begin to share her anecdotes and she's doing that in order to entertain the implied audience okay uh we've also got uh, a pre-modifying adjective proper being used in an interesting pragmatic way here it's creating humor because what ross is implying is that her acting occupation it's not really a job of work proper job so there's humor being created again link that in with the purpose of this that it's, he's trying to entertain the implied audience uh, we've got walter saying i was a nurse oh hello now this doesn't kind of make sense on its own without you actually seeing uh the actual interaction so this is dialectical the salutation hello really only makes sense in the context of seeing the photo of Wal walters as a nurse uh what else have we got we've got ross using these uh, positive politeness strategies yes because he says uh oh, it's beautiful oh, really lovely so he's using overtly complimentary language here so goffman would call that positive politeness strategies and they contrast with Walters, who's in a rather self-deprecating way. Uh, she's using an antonym. She's saying, oh, awful. OK, so you've got an interesting juxtaposition, the contrast between the two different kinds of adjectives that's being used there. <clears throat> and then finally, you've got this mention of Victoria here. I mean, did you get the reference to that? Uh, it's a dialectical reference. It assumes uh, audience schematic knowledge. You would have to know a thing or two about sort of 1990 sitcom because uh, uh, Julie Walters and Victoria Wood were TV comedy partners in the 1990s. So most of the audience tended to get that, which kind of shows the, the age of the audience. They tend to be young teenagers 
it tends to be middle-aged and older people who would who would get the deictical reference. These are examples, these bits in red, of how you can use these AO1 terms to put together some really interesting analysis of something as mundane as a chat show. Um, so if you were in my class, what I'd be getting you to do is to do a piece of writing that's about this. The uh, essay would be entitled Analyze How Walters and Ross Use Language to Create Meanings and Representations. You keep repeating that phrase, meanings and representation, because that's the paper one, section A question. Um, and because I'm a nice guy, I've given you some topic sentences as well in order for you to guide your reader. Um, so one topic sentence could be, Walters uses a range of speech features to represent herself as humorous and down to earth. So when we're talking about speech features, you could be drawing upon this kind of stuff here. Uh, Walters narrates an anecdote in an interesting way to entertain her implied audiences. So if you're <coughs> analysing the rest of the transcripts on page 89, she does tell this really funny story. So that's where you can be applying Labov and Goodwin's narrative structures. And an example of another topic sentence would be Ross plays an important part in using language to support Walter's contributions. So you, there you're looking at Ross and what he's doing to the conversation. And there again, you could be applying Goodwin to good effect. All the time that you're applying your analysis, make sure that you're linking in with the AO3 notions of contexts and representations. Okay, and in order to do a good job on that, can I just draw your attention to this, that in order to get the very highest level, what you're trying to do is draw attention to patterns and complexities. So rather than just honing in on a single feature and writing a whole paragraph about a single feature, to get your top grades, you're looking at patterns that are going across. Okay, so if, for example, tag questions are a feature that you see in three or four places, then that would be a pattern and you'd be able to do an analysis of how the speakers are using pattern uh, tag questions, maybe for different purposes in different parts of the text. <clears throat> so patterns is an important word. Guides the reader is important. This is the notion that you're using your topic sentences and you said that your, your paragraphs are really well shaped. And also on level five, it's this notion of wider contexts as well. So that you don't write about this as if it's just a, a spontaneous bit of chat between these two people, but that you understand the full televisual context of this, that you know, Ross has an audience in terms of Walters, but he's got a second audience as in terms of the studio audience, but he's also got a third audience in terms of the wider uh, watching public, you know, who are sitting in their sofas in their living rooms on a Saturday, on a Friday evening, watching the programme. So, and all of these people are having a pull on the language that's being used. And you're also thinking about the mode as well. You know, this isn't completely spontaneous by any means at all. This is very carefully set up. It may not have been actually scripted, but the two of them know exactly what they're going to be talking about in the five or 10 minutes that they've got in their chat show. So this is uh, understanding about the wider contexts. Okay, so to get your level fives, uh, write about patterns, make sure that you're guiding the reader and also put in stuff about the wider contexts of the language. The final thing I'd be getting you to be doing is this, where you'd be analysing some spoken discourse that you find yourself. So go off onto YouTube, find an interesting one minute clip from a chat show where you think people are using language in interesting sorts of ways. Um, transcribe a passage, uh, transcribe it using the convention shown. So, you know, page 89 in the booklet gets set out how the way that you would do it. You are basically omitting punctuation, conventional punctuation, and you're putting brackets in for pauses. If a pause is a second or longer, then you put within the bracket the number of seconds pause that is. There is a full explanation for this in your AQA textbook on page 242. So I'd invite you to have a read of that. Once you've done your transcripts and transcribing a piece of speech actually surprisingly takes quite a long time, even just a minute. So print it off and then that's where you need to be annotating it in terms of the sort of discourse and pragmatic features. And then once you've done all of that, 
then you can do the pretty similar process to what you did on the Ross Walters one, where you are writing an analysis of how the language in the transcript creates meanings and representations. Okay, so I hope that's been fairly useful in terms of discourse and pragmatics, and we're going to call it a day on that one. Thank you.